heard speak on a wide variety of subjects from this very podium. Uh, he's a man who has made the freedom movement his vocation and his passion for decades as a writer and a speaker and as the John Birch Society's public <coughs> relations director and as its president. Mr. John McManus, who is now President Emeritus of the John Bird Society, is, is going to introduce our featured speaker this evening, so we really want to welcome John. I wonder how many of you know about the Irishman who moved to Toronto. People said, well, why did you do that? He said, I wanted to drink Canada Dry. <laughs> I don't know what happened to him, but he probably tried. So thanks for the warm welcome. I think uh, regular attendees at these programs know it. I've been here before. It's the featured speaker tonight. I'm glad to be introducer of the featured speaker. I did want everyone to know that I have completed a long-awaited book called The uh, History of the John Birch Society. I'll hold up a copy here so you can see it. The book is priced at $25, but we're offering it tonight for $20. And if you can't uh, do that, there's a sheet of paper there to tell you how to send in to get it via the mail. So, uh, the John Birch Society, it's history recounted by someone who was there, and as the picture shows, it's, I was the one who was there with Robert Welch. <laughs> Over the course of many years in the John Birch Society, I discovered that some of our finest members started out their relationship with the organization by being its enemy, or at least on the other side of the political spectrum. <clears throat> These are people who were doers, not just passengers in any boat. Getting them to understand the society's work and purpose was well worth the effort spent because they were doers. I know that Gary Allen, a very popular writer for our books and magazines over the years. He's deceased now, but he initially scoffed at a neighbor who tried to get him to understand what was really happening to our country. Gary was a high school history teacher. He knew everything, until he ran into a virtue. So once he accepted the challenge to read a few books, Gary read them. He did an about face, and he asked for more books, and then became an activist in the Americanist cause. It was worth spending time, <coughs> excuse me, to get Gary Allen. When I first encountered a man who became one of my good friends in the Boston area, in the society, he was growing his own marijuana, he was studying how to make bombs, he was planning revolutionary activity, he was an activist. <laughs> After being challenged to read a couple of Birch Society books, he asked for more, ceased his association with numerous leftists, and eventually joined the Bird Society, which he's been a member of for now 30 some odd years. Some of you in this audience are probably aware that I started my own association with the Society by siding with William Buckley and his dishonest attacks on the John Bird Society and Robert Welsh. With prodding some from, from some Bird Society members, I did some reading and found out I'd been snookered by Buckley. Years later, I wrote a 250-page book full of evidence showing Buckley to be a pied piper for the establishment. He regularly put his stamp of approval on the U.S. government's harmful policies as he smeared our society regularly. I'm, some, I'm sure that some in this audience rose from detractor to member, or from foe to eager follower of Robert Welsh and his successes. Or you know some good members who reversed their own course. 
There are many examples of complete reversals by former foes who became active members of the society. They were all very valuable because they were activists, not just seekers of information. Which brings me to our speaker for the evening, William Jasper. Years ago, I was in the audience when Bill decided to start off his speech with some details about how he came to know and appreciate the society. It's quite a story. Living in Idaho, Bill entered the University of Idaho, which happens to be located in a city whose name is Moscow. <laughs> the University of Idaho is in Moscow, Idaho. Now, young and impressionable, Bill fell in with a crowd of leftists and was soon spouting their demands for socialism, revolution, even communism. He quit going to church, he devoured some Marxist gibberish, and he became a creature of the left. Well, then he received a letter from his parents telling him they had just joined the John Birch Society. <laughs> How could this be? He wondered. So he hurried to the family home in Idaho at his first opportunity to talk them out of their decision to be, to be Birchers. Dad wouldn't listen. Neither would Mom. All they said was, read these two books and then we'll talk. The two books were None Dare Call It Conspiracy and The Law by Frederick Bastiat, a classic introduction to what government should be. Well, Bill started the process that took him from an active leftist to a serious student of Birch supplied books, magazines, and tapes. The point I want to stress after all of this is that sometimes, although not always, a pronounced enemy can turn out to be a very valuable ally. I don't want you to give up on people quickly. You might have to give up after a time. Soon, Bill graduated from the University of Idaho, moved to Southern California. While there, he frequently visited the Society's branch office in San Marino, California. His eagerness to learn everything about the Society was offering led to his asking if there were any openings for employment. Happily, there were. And in 1976, Bill joined the Society's staff as a researcher. Soon, he was infiltrating leftist revolutionary groups and writing about them for the Society's magazines. He rose to be named contributing editor and then senior editor of our magazine. He's written important articles on domestic and foreign politics, terrorism, environment, education, immigration, the Constitution, the culture war, and most notably the United Nations. Bill was sent to Rio de Janeiro in 1992 to report on the first Earth Summit. He later traveled to Copenhagen for a UN Climate Summit, to the UN itself for its 50th anniversary, to San Francisco, Rome, Brussels, and other places all around the globe. He's been watching the UN trying to undermine our civilization while it was being expanded and celebrated. Any serious student of the United Nations should read and learn from Bill's books about the plan to build a UN into a tyrannical world government. These books are The United Nations Exposed and Global Tyranny Step by Step. In addition to traveling all over the world, Bill's numerous visits for the past 25 years to the U.S.-Mexican border and his reporting on the immigration topic have earned him the thanks of many. You'll hear his update on that topic shortly. Yeah, shortly. I, I, I'm not going to continue. <laughs> After the horrific bombing and loss of life at the Murrah Building in Oklahoma City, Bill went to Oklahoma, and the articles he produced about that tragedy were so incisive and so thorough and so important that the late Sam Francis said, Without question, William Jasper deserved to win the Pulitzer Prize, and I agree. Always willing to share his knowledge as a speaker, he has also helped many Americans to gain the truth about a variety of important issues via guest appearances on radio and television programs. 
His two books about the UN are by far the best and should be in everybody's library after you read them. I've long considered Bill Jasper an extremely valuable source of important information and perspective on an array of topics. I'm fortunate also to consider him a very good friend. Over the years, I even got to know Bill's late mom and dad, who did a very good job of raising a boy who didn't shy away from truth when he was exposed to it. And ladies and gentlemen, you're in for a treat this evening. I'm delighted now to turn the podium over to William F. Jasper. is one of my heroes and one of my inspirations for the last uh, 45 years. Uh, and he has been an inspiration to countless thousands of Americans. He's appeared on numerous radio, television talk shows. His column has appeared uh, for years as a column in weekly column in newspapers. And of course, his uh, programs on television, on C-SPAN, and his um, videos have awakened uh, much of America. We still have a long ways to go. Uh, our topic tonight is No Borders, No Nation. And it was a number of years ago, I believe I spoke here, on uh, immigration. Uh, we produced a video which uh, I filmed and directed and did the investigative reporting on called Out of Control, the Immigration Invasion. That was 30 years ago. And I'm one of the few journalists who have traveled all along the southern border with film crews or sometimes by myself filming all of the invasion that was taking place 30 years ago and more. For several years, I went along the border, and uh, so I went on a nationwide tour with that, and pointed out clear back then that there is an effort to destroy our borders and eradicate, abolish our nation. And now we see it being called for openly: no borders, no nation. Stop deportation. No borders, no nations. This is a, a video I'll talk about in here. This is a big concert in Europe celebrating this. No borders, no nations. There's an organization called No Borders, No Nation. We've been writing about it in the New American Magazine. Uh, but before we uh, get along any further, as is frequently the case at events uh, such as this, uh, we're confronted with both good news and bad news. And so I'm going to start with the bad news. Uh, the bad news is, uh, we, we admit when we're wrong, we've been a bit hard on Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Uh, this is our cover story, Knocking Her Green New Deal. And it turns out, that we were wrong. She, Ocasio-Cortez, has astounded all science. She has them in awe because she has found out, she has discovered a whole new element. Now you're all familiar with the periodic table of the elements. You remember this in high school. Everybody's groaning. Oh, 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 oh. And of course, you know, you all memorized all of the atomic weights and the atomic numbers and uh, all the protons and neutrons and morons of all of the <laughs> elements. And we know, of course, 
that H is for hydrogen, O is for oxygen, and C, well, that goes these days with that terrible CO2. The gas of life, which is now the public enemy number one. Uh, but then, you know, there's all those other elements, like silver, AG. AG? Well, where did they get AG? Silver? Well, why is that not SI? Well, Hollywood did that. It was the Lone Ranger that gave us silver. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when he got up there on the horse and he said, Argentum away. Now, Ohio Argentum. It didn't quite work, so they changed it to silver. But unfortunately, S was already taken by sulfur, SI was already taken by silicone, and so they went back to the old Latin AG, Argentum. But, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, AOC, came up with a new element. And with this, she has revolutionized, revolutionized science, and the Green New Deal is now possible. Instead of $100 trillion, the millennial socialist bartender from Brooklyn has come up with a new element. It's called governmentium. <laughs> and governmentium is the heaviest known element now to science. It has one neutron, 25 assistant neutrons, 88 deputy neutrons, 198 assistant deputy neutrons, giving it an atomic mass of 312. These 312 particles are held together by thousands of morons, which are surrounded by vast quantities of lepton-like particles called peons. Now, since governmentium has no electrons, it is inert. However, it can be detected because it impedes every reaction with which it comes into contact. A tiny amount of governmentium can cause a reaction that would normally take less than a second to take from four days to four years to complete. Governmentium has a normal half-life of two to six years. It does not decay, but instead undergoes a reorganization in which a portion of the assistant neutrons and deputy neutrons exchange places. <laughs> In fact, governmentium's mass will actually increase over time, since each reorganization causes more morons to become neutrons, forming isodopes. <laughs> this characteristic of moron promotion leads some scientists to believe that governmentium is formed whenever morons reach a critical concentration which is a th hypothetical quantity referred to as a critical morass. <laughs> now, when catalyzed with money, governmentium becomes administratium, symbol AD. This administratium is an element that radiates just as much energy as governmentium, since it has half as many peons, but twice as many morons. So indeed, we do owe Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez a great apology, and never let it be said that we don't own up to admitting we were wrong. Now, of course, she has great bearing on our subject tonight, because she is, of course, one of the primary cheerleaders for the No Borders, No Nation movement. And yes, it has become a movement. And she, of course, is also the darling of, and a member of, a leader of, the Democratic Socialists of America, DSA. Now, one of their slogans, which is on their website, which is on their Facebook page, is No Borders, No Walls, Sanctuary for All. No ban, no wall, no borders <laughs> at all. Now. The whole push for no borders, no nation, just a few years ago, was relegated simply to the ranting and raging of hardcore members of the Communist Party, the Revolutionary Communist Party, uh, the Socialist Workers Party, Trotskyites, 
Uh, nobody on the mainstream Democratic Party even approached that. I mean, that's lunacy. No, no borders. Uh, they knew that that was lunacy. But now we have actually reached that point where not only Ocasio-Cortez, but Keith Ellison, co-chairman of the Democratic Party, said that she is, and that this subject is, the future of the Democratic Party. So, uh, as I mentioned, this is a, what you see here is a picture of a big concert in Bern, Switzerland. No borders, no nation. You can watch it on YouTube if you want to, to subject yourself to it. Uh, but that's what's being promoted worldwide by socialists, by communists, by those who want, by globalists who are trying to destroy the nation state, national sovereignty, and create a global community or government. So we see abolish ICE, abolish profit. You see the socialist um, signs here. This has appeared in, this particular photo has appeared all across the nation and many others like it, but it really originated here. This is the Democratic Socialist of America website, Facebook page. That's Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez there uh, on the left-hand side. And uh, what does it say? It says, abolish profit, abolish prisons, abolish cash bail, abolish borders. Abolish borders, abolish prisons, abolish ICE, ICE being the uh, immigration and customs enforcement. No family separation. So now we see it expanding across uh, the whole sphere, particularly with the young generation making t-shirts and posters of this kind. Uh, all of these uh, no borders, no nation uh, slogans appearing uh, all over the popular culture. Here again is the festival in Bern, Switzerland, which I took off of YouTube. Here is one of the communist uh, organizations, Rise and Resist, which is a adjunct of the Revolutionary Communist Party, the RCP, which is a hardcore Maoist communist party. A Maoist, uh, for those who are not familiar with this, is someone who follows, who adheres to Chairman Mao Zedong, the mass murderer of communist China. Again, the Democratic Socialists of America are mainstreaming this with the help of the fake news media, with the help of the so-called mainstream Democratic Party, uh, to make this now acceptable and the actual preferred uh, position of the younger people who have no knowledge about what socialism and communism have wrought, the misery and the death of, and the loss of liberty throughout the world over the last couple of generations. So they have uh, nice slogans like, no one is illegal. Well, we're not saying that people are illegal. Their activities can be illegal. If people illegally enter a country, then they have done an illegal act. No border, no nation, just people. Now here's the statement of the Communist uh, Party USA from their own uh, website. Uh, stop, stop the raids on workers. And we see it at, in all of the Communist Party's own uh, websites and in their newspapers and in their propaganda uh, machinery. They are pushing this idea that borders should not exist, that borders are unjust. Why is that? Because from the very beginning, from the Communist Manifesto onward, they believe in a global state and they've been pushing for global government uh, ever since. So we have organizations like Pueblo Sin Fronteras, People Without Borders, these are the folks that are pushing for the caravans, so-called, of illegal aliens coming from Latin America. This is a, a photo, one of many of the photos showing the massive numbers of illegals coming through Mexico to our southern border. And this has gained a lot of, of attention, and rightfully so. However, most of the other groups that are talking about this focus simply on the caravans 
and on the immediate danger that these vast numbers coming across the border represent. And they aren't telling you who is actually funding them, who is sponsoring them, and what the agenda is and the program behind this. And that's what we're going to go into here tonight. Because what you see here with the uh, caravans, so-called, these massive numbers that are coming in, you'll see from what we get into later, we are going to see far greater caravans coming up here, similar to what we, are, what we have seen in Europe and are still seeing in Europe, where hundreds of thousands, millions, are going to be coming across the border. But they are responding to pressure from below and pressure from above. And so we're going to, going to go into this and explain what you're seeing here when, you're, when you see these events happening in the news, what's causing this to happen? We go into this in the New American Magazine and, and expose this. We've been doing it for, for decades. In fact, in my old video uh, 30 years ago, out of control of the immigration, we showed clear back then they had Pueblos sin fronteras. They were calling for an end to borders back then. And those same organizations, the same activists, many of them associated with the ACLU and the National Lawyers Guild, the lawyers who are, who are behind this, who are representing them, they were active clear back then. So we're going to look at who's providing the pressure from below and who's providing the money and the pressure and the support from above. Now, when you start looking at the pressure from above, uh, this is a, the cover of Rolling Stone just a short time ago, uh, looking at uh, some of the key women in Congress now. Of course, Nancy Pelosi there, uh, Ocasio-Cortez, uh, uh, Ilhan Omar, and Kamala Harris. Uh, but they are providing pressure from above at the legislative, congressional level, but there is pressure above them. Uh, those who give them a voice in the media, those who provide them with the money, those who are supporting all of their agenda. So we're going to be looking at them tonight as well. Uh, here's an individual which most Americans will not be familiar with. His name is Strobe Talbot. If you remember from back in the days of Bill Clinton, Strobe Talbot was his advisor. He's also an advisor more recently to Hillary Clinton. He's an advisor to George Soros. He's the president of the Brookings Institute. Uh, he wrote a very important essay in Time magazine in 1992 called The Birth of the Global Nation. And he said, nationhood as we know it will be obsolete. All states will recognize a single global authority. And that was in Time Magazine. He was, for many years, for decades, Time Magazine's uh, reporter and commentator. Uh, he still is. Uh, he still appears in, on a lot of the important uh, programs. We're going to look at him a little bit uh, later. He, of course, is a liberal left Democrat, and even worse, as we go into, as I give, give you his background. But we're getting at this pressure from above from the Republicans as well, from the pillars of the Republican establishment. This man here is Robert Bartley. Robert Bartley was for 30 years the editor of the Wall Street Journal. He wrote the editorial page uh, for the Wall Street Journal. And he said in one of his famous or infamous essays, the nation state is finished. There shall be open borders. Now he's a Republican, pillar of uh, Wall Street. He is echoing the same words as Strobe Talbot, saying that we're going to have global government and doing this, pushing the same agenda as Kamala Harris and uh, AOC and Nancy Pelosi. Then we come to another individual who appears on the media quite frequently, and that is this man here, the president of the Council on Foreign Relations. You see him in this photo, he's at the World Economic Forum, where he and other members of the Council on Foreign Relations, or CFR, uh, are frequent uh, keynote speakers. And this was an essay that he wrote that said, state sovereignty must be altered in a globalized era. Uh, we will be talking about and uh, promoting this book, The Shadows of Power, the Council on Foreign Relations in America's 
Klein. Now, uh, we have it back there on the table. This is by James Perloff. We published this book. Uh, it's been out now for 28, 29 years. Uh, this is a classic on the Council on Foreign Relations. That is, those people who are the organized forces for globalism, world government, and for destroying national sovereignty. Uh, we're going to get into briefly the Global Compact on Migration. This is the United Nations plan, which just uh, they just came out with last year in 2018. Thankfully, President Trump pulled out of that. President Obama had us scheduled to go into the Migration Compact and uh, President Trump said no, he didn't go. And because he didn't go and didn't send our State Department there, a dozen other countries uh, had enough courage to back out of it as well. This man, Antonio Gutierrez, the former president of Socialist International, former uh, High Commissioner for Refugees, the principal one at the UN pushing that global compact, was promoted as a result and made uh, the head, he's now the head of the United Nations. And of course, they have been promoting this at their World Government Summit. That just happened a couple of months ago. They actually call it the World Government Summit. You know, for years, the John Birch Society, New American one, we've been saying, look, these globalists, they are pushing for world government. I went to a, a, a uh, summit on the New World Order in uh, 1998 in, at Purdue University. And we had Richard Luger and a bunch of other uh, senators and uh, big globalists there. And I pointedly asked them, as a journalist, uh, I said, uh, uh, does the New World Order in your parlance mean world government or global government? They all said, oh, no, 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 nobody believes in that. No, no, no. We're, we're not, we're not for that. That's, that's passe. Nobody believes in that. Well, of course, we knew that they, were, uh, that they were outright lying there. Now they have dropped all pretense, and they actually have this summit every year. But you don't hear about it. You don't read about it uh, in uh, Time or Newsweek or hear about it uh, even on Fox News. They don't mention this World Summit every year. Uh, but if you were reading the New American Magazine, uh, you wouldn't be reading about it, and we, we give you the link so you can go right there to the World Summit, you can watch it uh, and see all the big celebrities and all the big one-worlders and the State Department people and the ambassadors and people from the U.S. government who are promoting this. And yet, according to the fake news media, this isn't even happening, even though CNN and many of these other media uh, giants are sponsors of this summit. So, before we go any further, I would like to point out that it is critically important when we talk about immigration, when we talk about borders, when we talk about wall, we get some terms straight. Migration is not immigration. Migrants are not immigrants. Migration is not a right. Immigration is not even a right. But what's the difference between migration and immigration? It's very important because now the media has been blurring this and the politicians have been blurring this. And so they refer to all of these people coming into the country as immigrants. And when you are opposed to it, they say you're anti-immigrant. Migrants are people who migrate across borders. They don't go through the legal channels and immigrate. We have millions of immigrants who've come into this country. Every country in the world has immigration laws. Every country. There isn't a single one. Uh, maybe you can come up with one, uh, uh, but I've been researching for a long time. There aren't any countries that have uh, legally open borders. De facto, yes, but uh, legally, no. Every country has limitations. They set the rules on who may come in, how many may come in, under what conditions one may come in, and after one is allowed into the country, what rules one has to follow in order to stay in the country. 
Every country has those. That is immigration. So people who come and apply to enter into the United States and go through legal channels, and that means if they're coming here as permanent residents, that they have to be vetted, make sure they don't have communicable diseases, that they have means of support, that they're not just coming here to be uh, on our welfare rolls. Uh, all of those things are legal, legitimate, reasonable vetting procedures. That is immigration. Migration means we're just going to jump the border. Uh, we don't care about the laws. We're going to get in by hook or by crook, however we can. Um, and there are people, the no borders, no nation movement, people who want you to believe that that is a right. That everybody has a right to just do that. Now, those same people, ask them on their apartment or their condo or their house, or their mansion? Do they have doors? Do they have windows? Do they have gates? Yes, many of them live in huge gated communities, <laughs> mansions, you know, so, so uh, Cher and uh, uh, all the rest of the uh, Hollywood crowd that are all for this no borders, no nation, they, they have gates. I, I assure you, I've been to a lot of these places in Hollywood and Beverly Hills, they have uh, their gates, their doors, their locks, their secure uh, areas, their guards, armed guards around their property. And yet they're saying we as a nation have no right to do that. So uh, we have to get uh, straight on that. Opposing migration does not make one anti-immigrant. Supporting reasonable immigration restrictions does not make one anti-immigrant. Immigrant. Supporting reasonable immigration restrictions does not make one racist or xenophobic. Uh, this is a, a, an article from the New American Magazine in which uh, Alex Newman is interviewing uh, this lady who is the head of legal immigrants for America. She is a legal immigrant who came here from Nicaragua uh, 30 years ago. And she's very passionate. She's in favor of having more immigrants come here. But she says they have to go through the legal procedures. All the rest of us uh, had to do that, and everybody else has to, if we're going to have any kind of semblance of liberty or order in this nation, if we are going to have a nation. It's very, very good uh, and passionate uh, plea. And uh, so that's something you can share with, uh, with your friends. Exercising judicious control over one's borders is an essential feature of sovereignty. Sovereignty is a very important concept that is being lost. Every nation, if it's going to, if it's going to have any uh, history and it's going to have any future, has to exercise its sovereignty. You lose your sovereignty, you're not going to have a nation. Exercising judicious control over one's borders is essential to national survival. Failure to control one's borders is a guarantee of national suicide. Open borders progressives and globalists intend to suicide us. They intend to use unrestricted migration to completely transform and abolish the United States of America as we know it. And I'll be getting into that in more detail as we go on. It's very important for us to recognize that border walls will ultimately fail if we give up our sovereignty. That's very important because the United States, Mexico, Canada, USMCA pact is a direct attack on our sovereignty. And here's one of the, the real... Uh, uh, problems that we were running into with the current administration. The John Birch Society and New American Magazine, we've been very supportive of President Trump, much of his program. Uh, we have defended him against uh, many of the baseless attacks on him. He's been viciously smeared. We've pointed out that the deep state, meaning those powers within the globalists, within our government, within the media, within financial institutions that have been attacking him, have been 
incredibly malicious and subversive and, and treasonous in their attacks upon him. However, for whatever reasons, we don't understand all these uh, mysteries. We try to figure it out. President Trump is supporting the USMCA, which was negotiated by holdovers from the Obama administration and his own top negotiator that he mysteriously appointed, Robert Lighthizer, who's a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, a committed globalist, and the USMCA is brings together the worst features of NAFTA, which President Trump, candidate Trump, rightfully denounced and said was terrible, and the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which he also uh, denounced. Uh, the USMCA is uh, would institute that same thing, and without going into it in great detail, uh, because this particular issue of the New American, our special report on here, provides that for you, and we have it back here. But among other things, it would implement here for the United States, Canada, and Mexico, that's what USMCA stands for, uh, United States, Canada, Mexico, uh, it would create a regional government like the European Union, which is what has allowed European Union bureaucrats to ramrod uh, through Europe all of that tsunami of refugees, uh, migrants, in, in 2015, 16, 17, and ongoing today. So the USMCA is a prime example of what we see, pressure from above and pressure from below. Now, the Pueblo Sin Fronteras uh, group, which is um, pushing for an end to open borders, uh, once the, if we allow the USMCA to come into existence, uh, uh, Pueblo Sin Fronteras and their people will bring lawsuits against any of our uh, laws prohibiting them coming into the country. They will appeal to the United Nations and to the World Trade Organization. Under the USMCA, our courts have to yield to the World Trade Organization. Uh, so we're going to see some very bad things happen if, if we allow that to happen. Pueblo Sin Fronteras is a creature from La Familia Latina Unida, which is a United Latin family in Chicago. This is part of the Saul Alinsky network that was started in, in Chicago. Central Frontiers in Chicago, the National Lawyers Guild, which is a, has, was officially cited by the federal government as a communist front, the ACLU, the Ford Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, and the United Nations High Commission on Refugees. <clears throat> now, it's no secret that the level of uh, invasion on our southern border is at crisis level. This is an article from the New American Magazine, the CPB, the uh, Customs and Border uh, Patrol. Uh, borders in crisis. The situation is unsustainable. Let us go through a few of the other articles. This is from the New American Magazine. Uh, we've been uh, focusing on this uh, very heavily over the last uh, several years. These are all just from recently in the last uh, couple of months. The border is virtually wide open. <clears throat> in 90 days, DHS uh, loses 100,000 illegals. Loses uh, 100,000 illegal aliens on unsuspecting Americans. Uh, it's uh, become really an emergency. Border Patrol caravan-like numbers hitting the border every week. Last week, 1,766 caught in one day. Illegal alien invasion crisis is not just at the border. Pointing out that all across the country we have visa overstays. A lot of people, the more sophisticated people, people with a little more means, who don't have to just try to sneak across the southern border, fly in here on tourist visas, business visas, temporary worker visas, and then just stay and never return. Overwhelmed by illegal migrant drop-offs, Las Cruces, New Mexico, appeals for donations. Catch and release floods Yuma, Arizona with migrants. Mayor declares emergency. 
Mexican so how many of you heard about this? This was three weeks ago. Mexican soldiers stop and disarm U.S. troops on the U.S. side of our border. Caught at the border, a, mur a murderer deported three times previously, another three-timer, and a girl with measles. Now, these are some of the things indicating that there is a crisis. But you saw a couple of months ago on CNN, Don Lemon, on CNN, uh, Cuomo, on CNN, and on MSNBC, and on CBS, all of the talking heads taking the president to task for claiming there is a crisis on the border. They all said, oh, that's ridiculous, there's not a, a crisis. The New York Times did a fact check and they had big headlines, false. The crisis is not on the border, is not in crisis. Numbers are down. Well, uh, you'll see we did a, a story in the New American. Finally, about four weeks ago, the New York Times comes out and says, oh, there's a crisis on the border. But what if there were 42 million at the border? This is a headline uh, from the Gallup poll. Uh, the Gallup poll is not, last I checked, we're not a secret birch affiliate. The Gallup poll is very establishment. It said this, quote, open borders could potentially attract 42 million Latin Americans, a full 5 million who are planning to move in the next 12 months say they are moving to the United States. Five million said within the coming year they're going to move to the United States. Did you read about that in your press? I don't think so. You read about it in the New American. Uh, we had, as Gallup, five million illegals headed for the U.S. within a year. Forty-two million more want to come. So, uh, this is a, these are just some of the pictures of Europe's migration crisis. Uh, I mean, you, uh, a lot of people, when it was in the news in 2015, 2016, uh, now it's kind of old news. It's still, still ongoing there. If you've been to Europe, you know how it's completely changed the whole face and makeup and political and social and religious makeup of, of Europe. Uh, we did a, a big cover expose on this on using chaos to build power. And the refugee crisis, the migrant crisis, has been intentionally used to destroy Europe. It's an attack on Christendom, attack on Christian order, an attack on the whole legal structure of, of Europe. And it's the same thing that is being planned for here. So we, we had this our re refugee crisis using chaos to build power, and again, one of the key architects of this is Antonio Gutierrez, at that point, UN High Commissioner for Refugees at the United Nations. He was a former head of the Socialist International, uh, President, Prime Minister of Portugal. And they targeted the United States. This is the map under the Obama administration for all of the places around the country where they plan to bring these refugees. And they did bring thousands of them here, but after Americans got enough of a clue as to what was happening, we put the stop to it. And uh, we did this story, is Obama's refugee surge coming to your hometown. Uh, that's what we see happening now with the migration crisis, with these so-called caravans still coming here to the United States. They plan to completely overrun the United States. Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, a.k.a. AMLO, he's usually referred to in the headlines and in many stories as AMLO. He's the Marxist president of Mexico. We don't have time to go into all of his background, but very uh, tellingly, here, here's an article from uh, Bloomberg News Service. Mexico's bloodshed surges in the first months of AMLO's presidency. Uh, if you haven't been following things in Mexico, 
I mean, a lot of people were saying, all, a lot of people in the media, that AMLO, he's the great new socialist uh, leader there, he was going to make things better. Well, it's been getting worse, and that does not portend well for our borders. So, um, when I uh, did our video, uh, Out of Control of the Immigration Invasion, this was clear back at the end of the Reagan administration. You'll see in there, there's a slide giving the various estimates of how many illegals are here in the country. This is back then, 30 years ago. And they're saying 7 million, 11 million, 12 million, 16 million. Well, those are the same numbers that you've been getting all this time. Uh, in fact, the most regular number you hear is 11.2 or 11.4 million illegals who are here already. Well, here's a, a recent study done by a liberally accepted uh, journal of science, the Public uh, Library of Science Journal, PLOS One. And here's what they say in this headline. The number of undocumented immigrants in the United States, estimates based on demographic modeling with data from 1990 to 2016, they found that, quote, our conservative estimate is 16.7 million for 2016, nearly 50% higher than the most prominent current estimate of 11.3 million, which is based on a survey data and thus different sources and methods. The mean estimate based on our simulation analysis is 22.1 million, essentially double the current widely accepted estimate, end quote. In other words, so these guys who've done the most extensive uh, evaluation of that say that it's more likely there's around 22 million plus illegal aliens, migrants here. Uh, dang, folks, that's a big number. <laughs> and it's a lot worse than what they, they've been saying. They've been drastically, intentionally undercounting all of this time so as not to alarm people on building. So we don't know, that, here's the, the takeaway from it, we don't know how many are actually here. That itself is frightening. Uh, but it could well be that the 22 million is correct. Whether it's 11 million, 22 million, or somewhere in between, that is serious, folks. Uh, and the UN Global Compact on Migration wants to make it even worse. This is the final draft. This is the one that was approved by all the countries of the world except for us and a dozen other countries uh, this uh, last July. Uh, Global Compact for Safe, Orderly, and Regular Migration. I'm not going to go into all of it. We wrote about it in the New American Magazine. But it, here it says, Objective 23, strengthen international cooperation and global partnerships for safe, orderly, and regular migration. In other words, they're setting into stone here in this compact uh, the UN's imprimatur, the UN's approval for migration, that people have a right to migrate. And it also goes on to say, we also commit to promote the mutually reinforcing nature between the global compact and existing international legal and policy frameworks by aligning the implementation of this global compact with such frameworks, particularly the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, as well as the Addis Ababa Action Agenda, et cetera, et cetera. The 2030 Agenda is part of the, that's Agenda 2030, the replacement for Agenda 21. So this is coming through the United Nations, but who helps actually put this together for the United Nations? Well, we'll just, briefly go into one of them to show you this network that has been created that brings about all of these things that suddenly just seem to be falling into place. And uh, where do all of these ideas come from? Well, a very important one is this organization, the Migration Policy Institute. Migration Policy Institute, MPI. They are probably the foremost group that has been mainstreaming this idea of changing immigration to migration, making migration a right. So who 
uh, and what uh, are the Migration Policy Institute? Well, the one who started it is this woman, Doris Meissner. You might remember her name. She was Commissioner of Immigration under Bill Clinton. She's a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. She worked for the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. The Carnegie Endowment, of course, was the alma mater of uh, Soviet agent Alger Hiss, the first head of the United Nations at its founding conference in San Francisco. Uh, the Carnegie Endowment has been, along with the Council on Foreign Relations, the Brookings Institution, uh, one of the most important think tanks and promoters of globalism. So she started the MPI first under the Carnegie Endowment, then it broke off and became, uh, became independent. Uh, it still works closely with the Council on Foreign Relations, Brookings, and Carnegie. Uh, so the funders for this, again, you follow the money. You want to find out who really is helping provide this pressure from above. The Carnegie Endowment, Chicago Council on Foreign Relations, the European Commission, the Ford Foundation, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Government of Canada, Government of Mexico, the Open Society Foundation, that's Soros, the Rockefeller Foundation, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. And of course, uh, George Soros provided some of the earliest funding for it and has been one of the big promoters of all of the carnage and chaos uh, throughout Europe. Now, uh, we mentioned earlier uh, Robert Bartley, uh, editor of the Wall Street Journal, uh, promoter of globalism, uh, the end of nationhood, the end of uh, uh, the nation state, uh, open borders, uh, through the pages of the Wall Street Journal. Uh, there are other, uh, others like him. This is Gideon Rockman, not a, a household name, but he is very well known in all the circles of power. He is one of the top writers, editors for the Financial Times. The Financial Times of London is one of the most influential uh, publications in the world. He wrote this article, which we highlighted in the New American Magazine. The title of it was, And Now for a World Government. And he, in this uh, article, says, so it seems everything is in place for the first time since Homo sapiens began to doodle on cave walls, there is an argument, an opportunity, and a means to make serious steps toward world government. But the third point, a change in the political atmosphere suggests that global governance could come much sooner than that which has been forecast. The financial crisis and climate change are pushing national governments towards global solutions, even in the countries as such as China and the U.S. that are traditionally fierce guardians of national sovereignty. So, uh, these are just a, a couple of examples, but here we see on the Financial Times, uh, right on, the, on their advertising, the homepage, they say, become a global citizen, become an FT, Financial Times, subscriber. You see, these folks, these globalists, view themselves as global citizens, and not just global citizens, the global would be rulers. They want you to think of yourselves as global citizens so that you will accept them and all these global elites as the rightful global rulers, those who know better than all the rest of us how the world should be run. Uh, so this brings it then again, uh, we're gonna look more closely at this. I mentioned earlier Strobe Talbot's essay, The Birth of the Global Nation in Time Magazine. And uh, I mentioned also uh, that he, he stated in there, nationhood as we know it will be obsolete. All states will recognize a single global authority. He went on to say, nationhood as we know it will be obsolete. If it, it has taken the events in our own wondrous and terrible century to clinch the case for world government. Perhaps national sovereignty wasn't such a great idea after all. So it's important to realize that when Strobe Talbot does this, and that essay has been now immortalized, it's handed out in college classrooms, it's one that all everybody has to read. Uh, it is, he would receive the uh, uh, World Federalist Association Award for, for this. Uh, but who is Strobe Talbot? 
Well, he was Bill Clinton's pal, roommate, and ambassador at large, who was a fellow Rhodes Scholar at Oxford University. He was Hillary, Clinton, he, Hillary Clinton's advisor, George Soros' advisor, the Brookings Institution president, member of the Council on Foreign Relations, member of the World Federalist Association, uh, and as the Los Angeles Times said in this article, Strobe Talbot leads toward one world. Well, we had pointed out long before the LA Times did this article that Strobe Talbot was very likely, the evidence was very strong, that he was a Soviet agent. Years later, we have a top Soviet agent who comes out and exposes that. This is Sergei Trechikov. He was one of the most important uh, defectors in recent times to come out of the Soviet Union. And this is his book uh, by uh, Pete Early. Pete Early is a, a journalist for the, Wall, uh, for the Washington Post, liberal left uh, journalist for, for the establishment of the Washington Post. He wrote this book, Comrade J, The Untold Secrets of Russia's Master Spy in America After the End of the Cold War. And uh, Victor, excuse me, Sorry, I mixed up my left and my right hands. Uh, Sergei Tretikov exposed him in this book, uh, but years before, we had exposed him in the New American Magazine, and even before that in the Review of the News Magazine. He was the translator. He went to, to Moscow, Russia, for Time Magazine, and he was the translator for Nikita Khrushchev's memoirs. That's what launched him onto his fame as this great big Russian scholar. He pointed out at the time that he was almost certainly fed that by the KGB, by his mentor, Victor Luis, who was a Soviet KGB agent. He was well known as a KGB agent. He was a so-called journalist, CBS, New York Times, Washington Post, and many of the British and European newspapers and publications relied on him extensively. He was a Soviet KGB agent, and he was Talbot's comrade. He was the one who provided Talbot with the Khrushchev memoirs to make uh, his fame and fortune. So here is uh, Strobe Talbot at the um, Brookings Institution, Rethinking Refugees. Uh, and the Brookings Institution, like the Carnegie Endowment Council on Foreign Relations, are pushing this whole idea that we have to accept all of the so-called refugees, migrants, that the United Nations assigns to us. So whose agenda are they promoting there? Are they trying to promote America's best interests, or are they trying to promote the globalist agenda? So here, here we have an example of how, how this works. Here is uh, World Beyond Borders, an organization run out of UCLA, the University of California, in Los Angeles, uh, <clears throat> promoting a world without borders. And this is one of the primary texts that they have the students read, The Birth of the Global Nation by Strobe Talbot. This is the website, and this is the young gal who runs the, uh, the website and the organization, uh, promoting this amongst the young people. That's why you see all these people out there, young people, promoting holy these signs, no borders, no nation. <clears throat> so, we've already mentioned uh, Antonio Gutierrez. Here, here he is, you see him, the head of the United Nations, now previously the head of the United Nations High Commission for Refugees, the, one of the architects of this whole push. Here he is being featured at the United Nations, excuse me, at the Council on Foreign Relations. You can see in the background there, it says Council on Foreign Relations. This is one of their events where they are promoting him and he is promoting them. Uh, the Council on Foreign Relations uh, publishes many different things. This is, this is one of their uh, ones on migration called Domesticating the Giant, the Global Co Governance of Migration. They're all about promoting that. And just this past week, uh, we 
published on the New American Magazine, uh, something which you didn't see anywhere else. A very big event happened in Washington, D.C. It was this, the Council of Councils. Now, many people in here have heard of the Council on Foreign Relations. We've mentioned it several times. We've talked about James Perloff's book. But the Council of Councils is the expansion of the CFR. It is a project launched by them five, six years ago, in 2013. They have now 29 organizations in 24 countries, uh, all which are sister affiliates of theirs, so that they can coordinate all of these globalist designs in these various countries. So here we have one uh, in which they are, excuse me, uh, this one was on uh, their G20 Leaders Summit. So of course they often have these right before the G20 Summit, the G7 Summit, so that all the CFR globalists and their affiliates can direct these uh, so-called leaders in the right direction. Uh, this is one of their most recent ones, uh, Planet Earth. They're pushing all the globalist uh, things there. This is their actual Council of Councils uh, website. You can go on it, uh, find out all about it. This is the list of all of their different affiliates in the various countries. Uh, this is one of their uh, ones which I mentioned before on migration. They're pushing all of these global issues that they say require global action in order to have a solution to them. So they are, th this is the Council on Foreign Relations logo, the man on the horse there. The Council of Councils, their logo. And they are able to pull this off because they have control of all of the major organs of the media. Now this is a chart, it wasn't put together by us, this is put by SPR, which is a, it's the Swiss Propaganda Research Group, uh, they're in Switzerland, and they've done a number of charts and reports dealing with this. Uh, they're basically saying what we've been saying for decades, and this is one of their graphic ways of showing it. They show the Council on Foreign Relations, and this is a close-up of, of part of it, showing the individuals and the various media uh, and exposing uh, how a handful of people really are controlling everything that we're seeing. So here's the New York Times fact check that I referred to a little while ago. Fact check, President Trump's State of the Union address. President Trump described the illegal border crossings as an urgent national crisis. What does the New York Times say? Right below that, they say, this is false. Illegal border crossings have been declining for two decades. Well, uh, thanks to President Trump, his famous tweet heard around the world, he said, quote, the fake news media, parentheses, the failing New York Times, NBC News, ABC, CBS, CNN, close parentheses, is not my enemy, it is the enemy of the American people. He said that on February 17, 2017. Of course, all of the media said, oh, President Trump is attacking freedom of the press. President Trump is trying to be a dictator and close down the press. He was not doing anything of the sort. He was simply stating a fact. The, the, those media that are promoting globalism are enemies of the American people. They're trying to destroy this country. So, I mean, he made it very clear. He was, uh, he was asked specifically about this on Fox News by Ainsley Earhart. She said, is the press the enemy of the people? He responded, no, not at all. But the fake news is. And the fake news is comprised of, uh, it's a lot. It's a big chunk, okay? Somebody said, what's the chunk? I said, 80%. It's a lot. It's a lot. And, of course, he's absolutely right. The fake news media, who have been smearing all patriots, all conservatives, all pro-lifers, all pro-family people, all pro-gun people, uh, anybody that is for what is good and wholesome and right in this country gets smeared. Uh, we know that. The John Hurt Society has been smeared as bad or worse than, than anybody until uh, President Trump came along. Uh, so you won't see any of the fake news media that he mentioned here, and of course he just mentioned a few of them, 
talking about those things that are so important to our survival. In fact, they are promoting those things which are going to bring about the end of our country. So you won't see them talk about, for instance, the Cloward Piven strategy. Now, uh, we don't have time to go into it. Very basically, that's what we see happening here right now, but on a whole new level. What is the Cloward Piven strategy? That was announced in a very important essay in 1966 in the Nation magazine, the premier socialist magazine here in the United States for over a century, titled The Weight of the Poor. It was by, written by Andrew Cloward and Francis Fox Piven, then professors at Columbia University. The preface of their, their essay was this. Look, we need to get as many people on welfare, as many people riding the wagon as we can, so that there are more people riding the wagon than pulling it. The system will collapse, and we can then institute socialism. That was basically their strategy. Look, we have to get every kind of program we can going, get people signed up on it. Well, they've done that for the last 50 years, and it's work. I mean, more and more people have jumped on the wagon, fewer and fewer people are pulling it. However, it hasn't worked well enough. America has been too resilient, it's outfoxed them, and especially now with President Trump bringing jobs back, uh, people are seeing that, hey, I can get ahead better by working than by being on welfare. So some people are going to get off of welfare. They don't want that. So they decided, hey, um, it looks like this is not going to work very well, particularly because not everybody's going along with this. When it comes to issues like abolishing ICE, they found that 73% of swing voters were against it, 73% of independents, 59% of Democrats, 78% of Republicans, 63% of Blacks, 50% even of Hispanics, 68% of men, 70% of women, even Hillary Clinton voters, people who voted for Hillary, 59% said this is ridiculous, we can't abolish ICE. And then when you get to the Harvard-Harris poll, again, this is these are liberal left establishment polls, people who want stricter immigration controls, it's most voters across the board, 70%, independents, 69%, Democrats, 51%, Republicans, 92%, Blacks, 53%, Hispanics, 51%. Men, 72%. Women, 68%. <sighs> Cloward Piven is not working. All these people are not going to go along with this. What are we going to do? We have to import some new voters. That's what, the, that's what this is all about. Break down the borders, bring in new voters, get them all on welfare, get them all voting for our uh, Ocasio-Cortezes. Get them out demonstrating in the street, create the pressure from below, we'll have the pressure from above with all the media, and that's what uh, this is all about. They want illegal aliens here, migrants, illegal migrants, so that they will vote left-wing Democrat. These are not the old Democrats of the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Uh, these are the new Democrats that they want, um, and they want to replace them. So they uh, are voting to bring in a migrant horde. Now, the reason they're doing this is this is a book that we published uh, many years ago. Uh, before we published this version of it, we carried the original one that was published here in the 60s, and not a shot is fired. The original title of it was How Parliament Can Play a Revolutionary Role in the Transition to Socialism. And it was written by Jan Kozak, strategist theoretician for the Communist Party in Czechoslovakia. And he wrote this to show that you don't have to even have a violent revolution of firing a shot. You can vote yourselves into slavery. And he goes through there showing how you get the people to vote for move, and move down the dial on every one of these issues to create ungovernable society so that eventually you end up in a transition to socialism. And when he said socialism, <coughs> he meant communism. I mean, he was a, he was a leader of the Communist Party. Uh, they often use those terms interchangeably. So that is where 
we are headed. He, that's where he explains the scissors strategy. He says we have pressure from below and pressure from above. We make it appear that what the people are calling for in the streets with all their demonstrations, etc., all the signs and everything that have been prearranged, all orchestrated, that this is the popular will of the people. And the politicians don't want to go against the will of the people. They know they want to get reelected. Uh, so they, they orchestrated this all out. And that's what we see happening here right now. So unless we recognize this and help our fellow citizens understand this, uh, they will either go along with it or uh, those who are not convinced and don't want to, uh, uh, to, to join in it uh, will say, well, there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, it it's, it's, all, uh, it's all gone too far. There's nothing we can do. But there is something we can do. Uh, the John Bird Society at the New American, among many things that we do, is we publish the Freedom Index. We publish it in the New American magazine, and we publish it online. And we show who the politicians are, who the statesmen are, who is voting for constitutional issues and taking a constitutional stand on all of the important issues of our day. We show all of their uh, voting records, and then you can go on each individual congressman and see how he voted on, on each of the issues that are important. We give a breakdown of uh, each issue, give a summary of it, so you don't have to slog through all these tedious, uh, incomprehensible pieces of legislation. I've done that before. You don't want to <laughs> waste your time doing that. You want to have somebody else <laughs> to do it for you. Uh, but we give you where you can actually uh, click on a link and go to the original bill if you want to check it out for yourself. Um, and so we have to hold these congressmen accountable. They are being told that, no, you got to go along. All these people out in the street are demonstrating. They want to have uh, open borders. You got to go along with that. Well, we know that isn't uh, that isn't that isn't true, that isn't right, uh, as the Harris poll, the Gallup polls that I've cited have shown that. But most of them don't know that. We have to get that word out. We have to also hold accountable all of the politicians. Now, a lot of your conservative friends say, well, all you have to do is go vote on election day and vote Republican. Yes, that's how we've ended up with the Paul Ryans and the Mitch McConnells and the countless others who have gone before them, who have betrayed us again and again and again. The Republican label and the Democrat label don't cut it, folks. We have to look at who are the individuals. And we have to support those who are taking courageous stands. And you can usually have a clue if they're being clobbered by the media all the time for making common sense statements and taking stands for reasonable constitutional issues. They're probably good guys, so you need to go on their uh, uh, Freedom Index on the New American and find out. Uh, and then you need to support them when they're, uh, when they're in the right and hold them accountable when they're not. Uh, we have a president in the White House who is far from perfect from our standpoint, uh, however, Never in my lifetime, I've been doing this for 40, going on 45 years, and most of us in our lifetimes have never seen anyone stand up to the establishment as he currently is doing. Uh, and yet we had him in the White House for over two years now. We had two years where the House of Representatives and the Senate were controlled by the Republicans. And what happened? Well, almost nothing, but what happened was the leadership in the House and the Senate sabotaged every, every effort that we had to actually drain the swamp, build the wall, and to uh, stop globalism. And so, obviously, we have a lot of work to do, and that means we can't simply uh, go along with our friends who say, vote Republican. Vote Republican. We've been doing that for decades, folks, and we don't have decades left. 
uh, we have to get busy and go after those who are intentionally trying to destroy this country. We have this issue of the magazine called The Deep State. And this was written primarily, most of the articles in here, by my colleague, Alex Newman. Alex is a phenomenal young investigative reporter and international correspondent. And there are a lot of people talking about the deep state. Type in Amazon.com and go to deep state. You'll find about 50 books out there on the deep state. I have all of them. I know we've reviewed a lot of them. Some of them are by some of our friends. However, it's very frustrating for those of us that have been in the battle fighting against the deep state before it was called the deep state to go to those books and read and you never even see a mention in them of the Council on Foreign Relations. Go to the index in that. And that's like talking about organized crime in Chicago in the 1930s, never mentioning Al Capone. Uh, you know, if, if you're going to talk in generalities about the intelligence community and about James Comey and uh, uh, James Clapper and uh, John Brennan, yeah, those are bad guys, but how did they get put into those positions of power? How were they able to use those agencies against this country to try and pull off a coup? They were only able to do it because of the deep state which put them in there. And that means the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, you know, when uh, President Obama was elected, he received a memo from Michael Froman at Citibank, a top guy at the Council on Foreign Relations, outlining for him who he should appoint into all positions in his cabinet. And guess what? He appointed all of those people in positions of power. They were all Council on Foreign Relations members. And we didn't officially learn about that until years later when the WikiLeaks memo came out showing this Michael Froman email. And, uh, but we knew about that. We had already written about it in the New America. We didn't have the email, but we could already see it in action. We'd been exposing it for years already. Uh, but there's a reason for this, folks. It's either a lack of understanding on the part of many of these people or a lack of intestinal fortitude. Mostly the latter, because most of them have been informed about this. They are afraid. They are afraid to say it. Why? Because of the eye roll. You know, they're, they're afraid that, uh, that uh, CNN or NBC is going to call them conspiracy theorists. Folks, if we cave in on things like that, we're going to lose our freedom. We have to call a state a state. We have to call a conspiracy a conspiracy. We have to call the deep state the deep state. We have to identify them. And uh, the more people that do that, the more people will take courage, the more people will uh, begin going after them. So, the good folks here have been doing this for many years. And uh, thanks to them and people like them all over the country, many Americans have been exposed to this. Thanks to them, I was uh, finally exposed to them and was relieved of my ignorance. And uh, I'm in this fight for all these years, uh, like so many other people are, because of future generations. I'm a father and a grandfather. And I want my kids to have the chance to grow up in freedom, my grandkids. Uh, you know, what are we going to have if we don't do that? They will. They mean business. They mean to take this country away from us. I'm not going to let it happen. Are you? No. So ask yourself, what am I doing concretely? What did I do today? What did I do yesterday? What am I going to do tomorrow? All of us have limited time, limited resources, limited influence. But we do have all three of those things. And we must budget those for the freedom fight. 
And the John Birch Society has been uh, carrying this uh, fight for a long time. And the folks here have put together a program. You're fortunate to be in, in this Albany area, which is really a vital section, and you have the capital here and all those things that are, that are going on. Uh, you have a chance here to really be effective. You have all of the chapter structure here. They actually do public meetings like this. They have uh, uh, public uh, programs where they get out the word to, to people. They have action programs. They are going to be bringing Alex Newman here. Uh, as uh, Ed mentioned earlier, Alex wrote the bulk of this magazine, Rescuing Our Children. He is now on a monster tour across the country for the next three months, four months, uh, and he's traveling. He has places all over the country where he's speaking, and he, when he comes here, you need to have a amphitheater two, three, four, or five times larger than this uh, to get the word out, and uh, we can make a difference. We can uh, change this whole culture and, and bring back America. We can make America great again. So it's going to take all of our effort, and I'm counting on every one of you to join with us in that. This is something that is a, a challenge for our day. It's our call to greatness, to, to take this information and implant it in the hearts and minds of other people, particularly young people. You've got to get a lot of the young people to realize their stake in all of this. So, uh, uh, finally, uh, I would like to mention who are all the chapter leaders here? Would all the chapter leaders and section leaders of the John Birch Society stand up? And if you're already standing, put up your arm so we can see who you are. Okay. So, these are, the, these are the people you need to contact. If you don't already know them, identify them, come and see them. Find out about their programs. You are going to, uh, if you haven't already signed your cards, sign those up and uh, make sure that we let you know about all the different things that are coming up. It's not just programs like this. There's other other things that are happening, uh, and we'll uh, get you plugged in so that you can uh, uh, join the join the battle and be effective in this. Thank you very much. God bless. You.